Good morning. My name is Todd Sanders. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber. We appreciate you joining us for our webinar today. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors who continue to demonstrate their commitment to our chamber, our community, and our state. A virtual round of applause for APS, SRP, and Fenimore Craig for their strong support. Today's presentation features two of Arizona's top education leaders who have worked tirelessly over the last few months to navigate the COVID-19 crisis as it impacts our school system and our community. We are thrilled to have them here to speak to our business community as we learn what they have planned for Arizona schools and how it will impact our community in the months ahead. To review today's agenda, we'll hear from Superintendent Hoffman and Dr. Geston, and then we'll move on to a Q&A discussion where we'll take audience questions. You may submit your questions via the Q&A box on the side of your screen, and we'll attempt to get through as many as possible, time permitting. We've had good luck with that um, thus far, but if you have questions now, go ahead and start queuing them up, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can. Before we begin our discussion with our education leaders, we do have another guest today to share some brief remarks about an important resource for our community during this time. And I can't think of a, a more important time. Um, as, as, re, as openings begin, and the governor announced that yesterday and the school year ends, we're going to address, we need to address where some of our kids will go um, during the day. As one of the largest providers in the state, the Boys and Girls Club is planning to reopen for summer programs and is keeping rates low for working families. Here to share a bit more about these programs, Marsha Mintz, CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of the Valley. Marsha, thank you for your leadership and your service to our community, and thank you for joining us today. Take Great, it away. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, Todd. I appreciate it. Um, as Todd mentioned, you know, we have been open for the past two months um, as the child care provider, primarily for our essential workers here in Arizona. We've been seeing anywhere between five to 700 kids a day throughout 10 locations. And we consolidated our locations to ensure we can provide a safe environment and small ratios and ensuring that our kids are getting what they need so the families who are out there on the front line did not have to worry about child care. Um, in addition, when the governor announced that schools would be closed for the rest of the year, we also began working with um, several uh, schools and communities to really address the issue of lack of technology, as well as a lack of an, a, an adult at home to help kids get through their programs and services. So we've transitioned a little bit. We have about 500, um, we have access to 500 computers and computer labs throughout our 27 locations, and we'll continue to do that throughout the summer. We're also serving um, two meals a day plus a snack. So serving thousands and thousands of meals each week um, and that will continue. Um, as we phase into what we call our summer program really starts next uh, week because as of yesterday, we started to receive literally hundreds of calls if we'd be open to uh, for working families, um, you know, as they go back to the workforce. So we've shifted into workforce reentry. How does it look like? As businesses want to open, where are they going to send their kids? So we want to make sure employers know that we are a resource for their um, employees. We'll have hopefully 20 sites open within the next couple of weeks, and we're going to do that safely under the guidelines of the CDC and the Arizona Department of Health. Um, our summer program is going to include some uh, summer learning loss programs. We've had great um, great experience with two-on-one -on -one distance learning where a teacher or a specialist is Zooming in, but our staff is still right in front of our kids safely, really making sure, especially the school-aged uh, you know, elementary as well as middle school kids are getting that hands-on experience right with a staff person or an adult that's really understanding the curriculum. Um, obviously, for, for the fall, we really want to work with our schools and our partners. Uh, you're going to hear from Superintendent Hoffman today, you know, and Dr. Geston, and we are there as their partners. You know, whether it's specific school districts on a rotation, you still have to have childcare for working families. And I think we're all here to be part of that solution. There's a lot of options coming up. School districts can use Title IV money to support social and emotional learning, which we are doing anyway, um, as well as, you know, looking for other, uh, other things that are coming up and 21st century funding for our out of schools time. So I want to thank the chamber really briefly. Um, you've been great partners, you know, for business businesses and so have we. So it's going to take the community coming together collectively with the school district, with the not-for-profit community, with the business community to make sure the thousands of kids out there have a place to go during the day and their families, their parents can continue to support the workforce of our state. So thank you and happy to answer questions later on in the Q&A if there are any. 
Marsha, thank you so much for joining us today for your leadership. It is a, it's a huge lift. And, uh, and we're, we're certainly going to look forward to partnering with you this summer and beyond and to ensure that we can provide these critical services to our families. So thank you. Now I'd like to turn it over to our state superintendent of public instruction, Kathy Hoffman, to provide a brief update from the Department of Education. Superintendent uh, Hoffman, thank you for joining us. Take it away. Thank you, Todd, and good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It is difficult for me to keep these remarks brief as there's just been so much happening, so much to update you all on, but happy to give a, a quick overview and of course happy to answer questions later to expand on any of these topics. Um, we have been so proud of everything our schools and our educators have been doing throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we were happy to be able to celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week to also to continue to highlight their their successes and their achievements, but of course, this transition has not been easy for anyone, so not for our schools, not for our families. Um, so we do want to acknowledge that all of the different challenges that, that our communities have been encountering during this time. Um, one of the stories I continue to go back to to highlight the achievements of our schools is one, just one example is from one of our rural communities out in the Pine Top Lakeside area. Uh, Blue Ridge High School specifically has is one of our many schools that has actually been using their career and technical education programs to create PPE for communities across Arizona, including sending that PPE equipment to our banner hospitals. Um, they have to date created over 400 face shields hundreds of face masks. They've been working on adapters and different pieces for ventilators. Um, so these are, that's just one example. I wanna always make sure we're highlighting the achievements of our students and teachers during this time. Just one great example of how our schools have been rising to the occasion. Um, I know what's on most people's mind is what is this going to look like in the next school year? So I'm very happy and proud that we convened a, a, a task force dedicated to planning for reopening schools in the next school year. I put, already put this in the chat box, but the, the plan going forward is for schools to open in the next school year. For some districts, that's as early as July. For most of our school districts, it's in August. However, um, if there's one thing we have learned in this pandemic, it's that none of this is predictable and we need to be prepared for all different types of scenarios. So the way I've been addressing this with our school leaders is to be planning for all different types of circumstances, have multiple contingency plans, so our work through this task force, which is made up of well over 75 people at this point, uh, made up of educators, school leaders, education organizations, um, as well as I'm very grateful to have the partnership with the Department of Health Services, the Arizona School Nurse Organization, and other health experts, because I know that the questions we keep getting over and over again is around those public health concerns. And so I keep saying we really need to be leaning on the medical experts, the epidemiologists to be providing that guidance and those recommendations when we're asking questions around things like social distancing or PPE and those types of, of medical recommendations really need to be coming from the medical experts. So we are partnering with them so they can be a part of our task force's work. Um, we also have subcommittees of this task force that are dedicated to supports for students, supports for educators and staff, supports for families, talking about family engagement strategies for our schools. Social emotional supports is really important during this time. We know there's been a lot of trauma in our communities through this crisis. So um, social emotional supports for the whole school community. Um, and, and another big comp component of this task force, or I should say a very important component, is thinking about all of the, um, thinking strategically around the future, if there are future school closures, which, and it could be one school needs to close, it could be a district, it could be a county, and, and I'm hopeful that we don't need to have a full-blown state closure again, but we need to be prepared for all different types of scenarios. So we do have a group specifically working on those types of um, strategies and also looking at the school finance component of that because I know many of our schools are interested in offering online, continuing with online learning or remote learning. Um, they wanna be able to have more flexibility and hybrid types of models if possible, uh, where students might be able to do some work online or some in the school. But right now our school finance structures, which is um, also 
in it's part of our state statutes in terms of school funding, um, there are some barriers to having that type of flexibility that we are trying to work through. So we have engaged with the governor's office as well as with um, legislators, we're meeting with legislators regularly right now to be discussing about these concerns, um, to be advocating to have uh, funding mechanisms in place to allow for any types of school closures as necessary in the future. So I know there's probably a lot of questions on that, um, but I just want to keep keep going that we are also working right now diligently on on the, the planning and process around distributing the CARES Act recovery funds. We as a state are receiving $277 million from the CARES Act federal funding specifically for K-12 education. The governor is also receiving $69 million, which can be used for either higher ed or K-12 education. So we have been collaborating with them on how can we have a comprehensive plan to make sure we're not duplicating efforts and to also make sure that our highest need schools and communities are receiving the funding they need. So highest need could be, there, we're looking at different indicators, including um, poverty, access to technology, impact of COVID-19, the things um, we're pulling the data to work with them to make sure that our highest need communities get the resources they need. Our schools can also receive uh, funding um, supports through DEMA, um, our Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, um, to get reimbursed for expenditures related to things like PPE. Um, I know another huge concern is around the digital divide and we are working on putting together a more education focused task force to address the concerns around the digital divide in Arizona. We have been surveying our schools across the state to get a better sense of their technology needs. Um, we're still working on aggregating that data, but there was also recently a, a Pew research study that was released. And that, um, that study estimated that around 175,000 students in Arizona do not have reliable internet connectivity at home. So that's one data point we can look at and we're still working on looking at other data. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, hopefully I'm still okay, have a minute. Um, I wanted to share my screen really fast and show you all a document that our department is using when we are advocating right now for um, having sustained, having stability in our school funding because I know there's huge concerns right now about the budget deficits that our state is facing. And, but as we have seen through this crisis, our schools are such a lifeline of supports for our families, for our communities. Um, so this is a document we put together to highlight that, that through our district and charter schools, all of our public schools across the state, we employ about 150,000 people to serve our families. The services we provide include, of course, teaching and learning, but also our schools have provided over 2.7 million meals. And it's actually now over 1,500 different sites across the state that are, are meal delivery sites. Um, so that nutritional support is critical. Of course, social emotional support, thinking about um, our kids that are, who, are, who are isolated during this time, who may be experiencing um, there may be illness or even death in the family during this time, job loss. Uh, so we want to make sure that our schools are fully staffed with school counselors, social workers, to make sure that families have access to the resources they need. And then last, I want to um, emphasize our schools are a place of, of maintaining economic stability for our communities because there are so many types of jobs within our schools. There's entry level, hourly paid jobs, as well as salaried positions that come with great health care, retirement benefits. So um, I just want to make sure we're emphasizing that. So as we present this document to our legislators, we're emphasizing ensuring that we have financial stability for our schools going into the next school year, uh, protecting our CARES Act funding. These are meant to be supplemental funds to support things like technology, PPE, social emotional supports, professional training for our educators. Uh, so we really need to be protective of those funds and not be using those funds as a way to make up for any state deficit. Um, and then last, we're all working together collaboratively with, the, like I said, the governor's office and our other state leaders to have statewide contingency plans to plan for future outbreaks or if there are future needs for school closures. So I know that was a huge data dump. As I said, this could easily be a 30 minute presentation, um, but happy to take questions in the future. Superintendent Hoffman, thank you so much. We, we appreciate you joining us today and, and obviously a, a pretty 
big lift for you and, and your team and who've enjoyed partnering with you. And we'll, we'll definitely have some Q&A here in, in just a minute. Um, so to our audience, I know you've submitted a few uh, questions. Go ahead and continue to do that. We'll get as many answered as possible. And I know uh, so the superintendent already answered one, so thank you. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Chad Gaston, superintendent of the Phoenix Union High School District to give a brief update. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Gaston. Take it away. Uh, you're welcome. Great to see everyone today. Todd, thanks for uh, the opportunity. And uh, Superintendent Hoffman, great to see you uh, as always. I uh, just want to share a few thoughts from a, from a district perspective, um, but we'll just so you know, as I share my thoughts today, um, I'm also sharing the collective thoughts of many superintendents. Uh, once a week, I convene all of the superintendents in Phoenix. Uh, we meet every Monday. Um, every other week, I convene a group of about 20 superintendents across the state, uh, from Tucson to Yuma to Bullhead City to Chinle to Flagstaff, just to try to uh, also understand the statewide perspective. Um, and so I, I'd share a few things. One is that we are, um, we are fully aware, we've known this uh, pre-COVID, we certainly know this now, that the, the American economy really relies upon the K-12 system, as Superintendent Hoffman said, uh, but really in two ways. One, yes, we are a major employer uh, of, of Arizona residents and really across our country, but uh, if schools don't reopen in some form or fashion, uh, the American economy cannot open in some form or fashion. So you heard from Marcia earlier talking about the critical role of Boys and Girls Club. Um, we also know that the school systems must do as much as possible to, to offer in-person instruction next year to try to help uh, families uh, get back to work and our, and our economy to continue to, to restart. And uh, because of that, what we're seeing, and I'll give you a Phoenix Union perspective, uh, is that we're working on a few different plans. In fact, Phoenix Union um, is actually working on four options for families next year. Uh, so not, not one option, not one size fits all, but four options. One is uh, an all virtual school that we know we have many families um, that will want an all virtual option for their children. One that they're uh, just not comfortable sending their youth uh, into classrooms every day uh, and will want to be able to keep their youth home. Uh, we also know uh, conversely that, that we'll have a lot of staff members that aren't quite ready to come back and sit in a classroom with 20 to 30 students as well. And so uh, we, are, we also know that our staff will want some flexibility in how they deliver instruction next year. Uh, the second option that we're going to offer our community is, uh, is in-person uh, classes that we're going to lower our class size to about 24. Um, I think that the only way for us to have some sort of distancing disinfectant uh, will be that, that we offer smaller class sizes. As you heard from the superintendent, we, we also do know that there will very likely be times when uh, we might have to go back out and be virtual again, whether those are rolling closures. Uh, hopefully we don't have a, a nationwide or a statewide closure again. Uh, but we're, we're not quite certain what flu season will look like next year. And uh, so we're trying to build in-person models that can quickly turn to, to virtual models as well. Uh, we also know from the high school perspective, uh, especially in um, communities of poverty, that high school students are often uh, the A contributor or the primary breadwinner to their family's income. Uh, and so we also know that many of our students will have to work during the day. Uh, to support their families. And so we're gonna offer a full evening school uh, option across the valley for our students and our families as well, so that our youth can go to work in the morning uh, and continue to take classes at night. Uh, and then the fourth option is a hybrid that we, we know that we're gonna have many families that um, will need help with childcare in the morning, uh, but have to send their kids to school in the afternoon or vice versa, that they can send their kids uh, maybe for the first four hours of the day, but then need to be able to go home uh, and take some virtual classes at night. And so we are um, working on a hybrid model. Uh, and uh, like as crazy as this sounds, Phoenix Union, uh, we've been working on a, on a new school concept for the last couple of years that we didn't think we would launch for a couple more years, but uh, we, we are gonna launch our 22nd school in our portfolio next year uh, that's called PXU City. Um, and it's a full um, hybrid, all independent study high school where we can work individually with families uh, and students to create uh, very unique learning uh, models for their students. 
uh, you know, part virtual classes, part online classes, part internships in the community. Uh, and the idea of PXU City is that ultimately the city is the classroom and, uh, and that we will work with our community to build really amazing options and models for families. Uh, so those are the four uh, models that, that we believe we need. And I know that as I talk to superintendents around the, uh, around the state, as you heard from Superintendent Hoffman, that we'll need flexible models and multiple plans to meet the needs. Uh, we are worried about a couple of things that I would just share. One is we're worried about the digital divide, as you heard from uh, Superintendent Hoffman. Uh, we uh, and uh, Todd and Jennifer uh, know this well. We've been in conversations with uh, the city and partner districts about uh, a massive collaboration between the city of Phoenix, uh, the at least at this point in time, the 14 uh, K-12, uh, the K-12 system of central Phoenix, and, um, and hopefully business and industry where uh, we are working on a strategy to try to blanket the entire city uh, with a computer network through um, cell towers. And um, I've had conversations and convenings with the mayor, the city manager, all the superintendents. Um, and ultimately we, uh, school districts in the cities uh, are, the, are the largest landowners um, of, of, of Phoenix, and that's true across our country. Uh, and so we have created a map of all of the properties uh, that are publicly owned at the city and the school districts, and are now creating a strategy of what, how many cell towers would it take for us to provide free Wi-Fi uh, for all the families uh, and also the adults within our valley. And, um, and have also had initial conversations about pooling some of our stimulus money together uh, at the city. Uh, community colleges, uh, I should mention as well, and universities are all a part of that discussion um, because we, we know for sure that we have to um, aggressively uh, attack the digital divide, uh, which I think leads us to the second thing that we're really worried about, which we've all known about the achievement gap that exists in our nation uh, and here in our city. Uh, that achievement gap ultimately, uh, from a business and industry perspective, you know, we are your future workforce. And so when that achievement gap is wide, uh, we have disparities in workforce, disparities in readiness, uh, disparities amongst communities. And um, what we say uh, often is that the gap was wide and, and I think it's getting wider every hour. And uh, that is a, that's a scary proposition, I think, for our kids and our families. And so we will have to be very aggressive on filling that gap. Um, and again, you heard Marcia talk about that a little bit earlier, that uh, there will need to be extra programs and we will offer those as well. Um, evenings, breaks, bring kids back early, uh, weekends to try to do all we can to fill uh, those gaps. And then I'll just share a couple other because I, I know we'll have a Q&A here in a moment. Uh, but we're going to launch an all virtual summer school this summer. Uh, we are, uh, we want to do our best to fill that gap leading into next year. And so we are encouraging our families as well as uh, entering freshmen to enroll in our virtual summer school. And what we're excited about is launching a full-scale virtual summer school. We'll have between 10 and 15,000 students in our summer school is it's going to give us a chance to pilot a couple of virtual options. Uh, because even within virtual education, there's not one option that fits uh, for every child. And some will need live interactive instruction that's just done virtually. Some are fine logging into an online curriculum um, and being independent. Some are going to need a blend of some online learning, some small group face-to-face -face instruction and tutoring. And so we're also gonna use our summer school to in many ways pilot and trial and error what really good effective uh, virtual instruction looks like. Uh, with uh, last thing I think that I'll, that I'll comment and then, uh, and then I'll be done. I'm, I've got, I think one more minute is we're also worried about our, um, we're worried about our employees. You heard Superintendent Hoffman talk about our concern for our students. Uh, we're very concerned as well. Uh, you know, most abuse and neglect that occurs in our nation occurs at home. Our kids are home uh, for multiple months. Many of our youth already lived uh, with anxiety and depression, uh, and we're seeing those uh, increase as well. Uh, but we're also worried about our staff, that our staff uh, is stressed. Our, many of our employees, although they're still employed with us, their spouses have lost jobs. And so I know from, from our perspective, we at our last board meeting, uh, approved staff social worker positions where, um, you know, we've been talking about what are we going to do about the health and wellness for our students? Well, we're, we're going to start to aggressively attack uh, the health and wellness of our employees as well and, and are launching a few staff social worker roles just to make sure that our, uh, our staff are well 
and ultimately that they can serve our kids better. There's a, a great book, this is my last comment, then I'll stop that says, if you don't feed your teachers, they'll eat your kids. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're feeding our teachers really well, uh, socially, emotionally, so that they can support our kids better. With that, I'll stop Todd and turn it over. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us as well. Pretty impressive framework you've got set up for next year. Never thought I would hear a four part or a four phase um, type plan. Before we get started, I did get a question in the Q&A chat about recording. We record all of our webinars and after the presentation, after the webinar is done, we will put it up. It'll probably be up by either later today or tonight. So you can find it there and we'll also see if we can't um, ask uh, Superintendent Hoffman to share her slide with that, us and we'll make sure that's up there um, as well. So let's, let's go ahead and get started. I think, I think the, the big issue of the day does seem to be the digital divide. I know that we partnered with with you, Superintendent Hoffman, um, on laptops. We have a, had a deficit of 100,000. Thankfully, that's down, I think, by 15,000 now, thanks to, to your efforts. We, we had a laptop drive, which, by the way, is still going. If you want to donate a laptop, we can do that. Any day the doctors, they'll clean and wipe it for you and, and make sure it gets to the proper hands. Um, Chad's talked about um, the, the program they've got and, and what they're doing. Um, they certainly risk resources are, are different for them than, for instance, the rural schools. So thinking about what this will look like for our rural schools and the digital divide, what are you, what are your thoughts on, and what what can we do to address that that disparity between urban and rural? And I'll I'll ask you, um, Superintendent Hoffman. Yeah. So one way that we were already working on expanding broadband internet to our rural communities is through the E-Rate program, which is a federally funded program. Um, so we have an E-Rate director who works in the department and he's, he's like a one-man show. He's traveling the state and basically explaining that this funding can be used to expand broadband out to schools or libraries. Um, they, they've already expanded this for miles and miles of our rural communities, um, but so we would be very supportive of additional federal funding for E-Rate the E-rate program, and that is currently in, uh, I just saw an action, an update that the, that is um, part of the proposal for the next, um, they're calling it the HEROES Act, the next federal funding stimulus package does include more, more money, over a billion dollars for the E-rate program. Um, it does, it takes a lot of time because it requires the installation of the cables, and I'm not the right person to describe this, but it's not something that can be done overnight. Um, and then, we also have to be thinking even about cultural considerations because when we're thinking about some of our Native American communities and that kind of construction on their land um, or even their even the demand of, of families who may not want that technology in their home. Um, but we, I recently heard someone say we need to be thinking not just about the whole child but the whole family and I think it's same with internet that it's um, you know Previously, we've been more focused on getting the internet to schools and libraries in our rural communities, but now we need to be thinking about like the whole community and what that looks like in the home. So I'll pause there. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, we have a, a question from uh, a colleague, uh, Superintendent Stanton, for, for you, Chad. Um, how are you considering funding these four options, both uh, maintenance and operation and capital, knowing that we may be facing declining enrollment? Yeah, so a couple of things, and uh, Dr. Stanton, good to good to hear from you. It's been too long. We should we should connect soon. Uh, a, a couple of things. Number one is that um, you know we are in providing multiple options, are hoping to capture as much of our enrollment as possible. We think if we don't offer multiple options, we will have a significant decline. We think if we're aggressive uh, in offering multiple options, and again, we've been surveying, so uh, you know these these four options didn't just uh, come. Uh, from ourselves, but in meeting and talking with our families and our staff, uh, we think this is this is the right option for us. Second um, is you know we know that that digital, um, depending on how you do digital in the model, which is why we're going to test this summer, that digital can be a cheaper model. Um, you know you need less staff on site, and so um, so we do think that as more and more families opt into digital, which can have more students per class. Um, that, that we also think that that will be a slight savings as well, depending on how many families move over to digital. Now we have a digital academy. Uh, we've had conversations with uh, Superintendent Hoffman's chief of staff uh, and the governor's office about the need for uh, our K-12 system to be able to launch virtual academies. Um, it is not the answer for everybody, uh, but these are known as AOIs uh, in our state. And um, we do think that 
we will need to have a simpler, perhaps expedited process for school systems to be able to launch AOI so that they in fact can uh, provide really high quality online learning opportunities. Um, and then I think the third, uh, Dr. Stan, to answer your question in particular is, we are um, gonna use our stimulus funds uh, to really launch uh, in particular this hybrid option, this PXU City option that, um, that, that will help us do the upfront cost to launch a completely new model. And then once we capture enough students, uh, our small schools become sustainable thereafter. Thank you, thank you, Chad. Um, so, and this, uh, I think this was a meant to be a, an offer to help, but, um, and, but I'm gonna make it in the form of a question for, for both of you. There was a, um, an offer by Cox that they would love to be part of the task force because certainly they've been providing internet for, for poor families throughout this, this crisis. And I think they want to continue to be part of that solution. But question I think is based on what Chad said and the importance of, of schools and, the, and, and sort of the economy, uh, any thought to adding um, a, a, a addition to, to Cox members of the business community to this task force, um, given the important relationship between the two? Yeah, I'll throw I, that I, out there generally. Yeah, uh, Superintendent Hoffman, feel free to go first. I'll go, I'll go after. Definitely. I actually just responded to that message and I sent over my project manager's email. We, would, we're, we're, we are looking to engage our business community in this work. Great. Um, and I don't know, if Chad, if you want to add, add anything to that. Yeah, I would just say two, two things. One, Cox has been a great partner, super appreciative. Um, and we, our initial conversations was really with public sector just to make sure that we were all willing to engage in this conversation. Now that we feel really good about this, it's time for us to start to, to include uh, as well. And I would say from a business and industry uh, perspective, I know that one of the issues, and this is true in rural, uh, in convening superintendents, is there some regulatory work that will probably need to happen as well to expedite if in fact we're gonna run fiber at a faster rate or run cell towers. Uh, there's some regulatory work as well that's gonna to need to, to have to happen. I think that's a place where business industry uh, can really help us as well. Thank you. And certainly when, if there's a special session, I'm sure that'll be something that needs to be addressed. Another question, I, and obviously a lot of questions from, from folks, uh, their parents, what's the plan for high school clubs and sports? Um, and those like football that have that have camps over the summer. And I know Superintendent Hoffman, I think you're looking at this now and maybe you could provide a few details. Yeah, so typically athletics are not within the scope of the Department of Education, but we have um, we, we do have a meeting scheduled to speak with the association that oversees sports. So I think um, Superintendent Gaston might have a little more information from the local level, but that is something that we are looking to include as part of our planning and the, the plan to reopen schools. Thank you. And there's another uh, question, um, I think this is for Chad specifically, and I, I, think that, I think it makes sense to me. Are, there, are the four options being considered specific to, to Phoenix Union, or are they uh, efforts for all the schools within your, the district you convene? Yeah, and I'm happy to, I'll answer that. Uh, let, I'll go quickly go back to the club and the sport uh, question as well from a school perspective. Uh, our, our hope is, um, and for one, we have to follow CDC guidelines. Um, what we do believe is much like you're seeing in professional sports, uh, is that schools, uh, so long as we can, you know, check temperature, make sure locker rooms and equipment is disinfected, that we are still hopeful that we'll be able to offer uh, clubs and sports next year, but very likely without fans. Um, we, in fact, are, uh, are doing our best to be able to live stream sporting events if, in fact, we're able to, uh, to have those, uh, have our technology team working uh, on our gymnasiums and our baseball fields and uh, putting together a proposal for us. Uh, but we are still hopeful, as is, uh, you'll hear from Superintendent Hoffman's meeting with AIA later today, uh, they will tell you the same thing, that we're, we're trying our best uh, to offer these opportunities. Our, our youth, again, uh, are sitting at home. They've been home since beginning of March. School will not happen until August. That's five months uh, at home. Uh, and clubs and sports are really what engage our youth today. And so um, high school systems, AIA are working really hard to keep those options open. Um, and then the, the second question was, are we, uh, is Phoenix Union's four-part model the only, you know, are we the only district doing that? No, they're uh, when you look at the systems across Phoenix, but even across the, the state that, although evening school, a uh, full-fledged evening school may be a little unique to high school, uh, I can tell you that in my conversations uh, with our superintendents that uh, 
uh, a, an online, full online version, a safe in-person version, and some form of hybrid version is certainly uh, at least a part of a three-part model for most school districts. Thank you. There's a question that came in that I think is interesting even as it relates to all the models and certainly the work you're doing, um, Superintendent Hoff, and that relates to kids, special ed kids. Um, our, what, what accommodations were we making for those, those kids who sort of fall outside that mean? That was a great question. I just started to type a response. Um, so yeah, I, I used to work in special education, so I have firsthand experience and an understanding of how challenging this must be for uh, many of our students with disabilities to lose that structured classroom setting, to have all of their special specialist providers like the speech pathologist, occupational therapist, you know, usually they're all in the building working with our students. Um, so I know this has been really challenging. So currently, um, you know, according to our federal laws, our schools are still required to be providing special education services. This may be looking different right now. I know when I've been talking to specialists that, um, or special ed teachers, that they uh, may be sending materials home. They may, and some of them are actually doing more training of parents than they said so they've ever done before, where they're teaching the parents of how to deliver some of these strategies and um, empower the teachers to be the, helping with these types of skills. And so um, I know there have been a lot of challenges. Our department has, we put out a lot of webinars. Um, we do virtual meetings regularly with special education directors for our school districts. And we also, if you go to our, our website, which is um, www.azed.gov, we have a COVID-19 resources page. And under there, there's a whole section dedicated to special education. And um, there's also lots of resources there for families, for educators, so um, definitely worth checking out. But I know special education has been really challenging for people, but there are ways to deliver special education services virtually or by mailing things. Um, so it, it may not look the same, but just like everyone else, we're, we're accommodating, we're modifying, transitioning, doing the best we can under the circumstances. Thank you for that. And as a dyslexic and former dyslexic student, I, th I thank you for for uh, for your leadership on that. So let's let's come into the classroom a little bit. Um, you know, we saw the pictures uh, that the, the governor got sort of hammered yesterday about the the bar in Tempe with all these college kids who are sort of immune to anything, um, all congregating together. Certainly, kids are not any different. Um, how are we going to practice social distancing in school? And I'll throw that out to both of you. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I, I'm happy to go first. Um, for you know, first of all, adults are just big kids, uh, so not surprising that we all forget uh, when we go out. Um, I, so I'll tell you that there are plans in place, um, but I do know it's going to be very challenging. And so I'll I'll just give you a couple of glimpses. One, um, you know, as you study even what's happening internationally, uh, school systems that are bringing kids back are requiring temperature checks. Uh, just to make sure that nobody is coming into school who's sick. I think that's going to be a part of a plan for most school districts. Uh, personal protective equipment, uh, even for students uh, and staff when they come back, is likely going to be a reality uh, for our kids and for our staff. The smallest class sizes possible uh, is also going to be, you know, with school districts across the nation are are situating desks right now to find out, you know, how many desks and students can you fit into a classroom to keep them six feet apart. I think you're gonna see uh, as best as possible socially distanced classrooms. Now, first of all, that uh, just for what it's worth, that's um, a, a big disappointment for educators. We've been working really hard for the last you know, 20 years to get away from desks and rows, kids working individually. We know the workforce wants kids that are collaborative and communicative, and we're worried that we're now going back 30 years. Um, but we do also think that that's a reality. Uh, and then I, I'd say two other, two other thoughts when it comes to safety on campus. One is that uh, we will very likely see breakfast and lunch in the classrooms. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to congregate hundreds or in high schools, thousands of kids in a cafeteria. Um, and then likewise, uh, the last comment I'll make is on you know, big school events, assemblies, uh, even staff meetings. You know, our, our high schools have 300 employees. Uh, you know, we're not even gonna be able to do in, in-person staff meetings for quite some time. Uh, and so I, it's just a glimpse into five or six, you know, types of changes that I think we'll see in schools. Thank you. Superintendent Hoppe, any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, Superintendent Gustin outlined that pretty well that 
the reality is our schools are places where people congregate. We have kids in classrooms, we have oversized classrooms. Uh, we've been talking for years about having our classroom sizes too big in any, most parts of the state. Um, you know, it would be great if we could hire more staff, but hiring has been a challenge for our schools in terms of recruiting, in terms of budgeting around hiring more staff. Um, so I think that having those different instructional models is part of what's so important around this, of, of, being, of allowing for students to either have flexible schedules where that could help reduce the number of kids in a school at one time, or having more kids learning from home when, when that's um, feasible for them. So that's why having those flexible instructional models is so important. Um, and then also thinking about, again, there we need to, we, when we think about different scenarios, thinking through if, um, if, there's a, if there's like a city that has no cases of COVID-19 versus um, like that could be like one scenario, but then if you have a case where there's a confirmed case in a school community, that's going to be a very different situation in terms of the types of measures that need to be put in place. And again, like if there are confirmed cases in a school community, whether it's a student or a teacher or a school staff, we will, that's, school will likely need to consider closing and that would be a decision made between the district and the county health office or with the department of health services that would not be a department of education decision um, but again just thinking through the different levels of risk and the different levels of, of cases in a community are going to be important in making these decisions uh, but i think that um, I would encourage our schools, and I have been encouraging our schools to already be thinking about all different types of contingency planning and all different options um, because it's each school community is so unique and has different, such different circumstances. So they, they need to be working now to be planning and, and also engaging with families and their staff so that there's trust and there's good communication about what the plans are going forward and they have more buy-in from their communities. Absolutely. Todd, well, Todd do ahead. you mind if I just wanted to throw in there that we have been operating for the last, you know, two and a half months. So we're seeing again, the first week we were open, thousand, you know, thousand kids a week. So I want to just echo that you've got to have these protocols in place now, even before you open. And we've had every scenario you can imagine because we have 10 sites currently operating. The key really for the success has been the hygiene protocols that are required both of staff as well as the kids we're serving because they're part of this with the school drop off and pick up. So you're really doing, going back to even what Chad said before, it's a whole family education process now on this re-entry. And it's going to be a partnership with the business community because as the kids are re-entering school, these parents are re-entering the workforce and there could be very different hygiene protocols across the board. Um, so we've got a lot of lessons learned that we're happy to share, especially from those who've been operating um, really information that came up working with Banner Health, the Arizona Department of Health, but it can be done and it can be done really safely. Um, so, I, you know, I'm proud to say we've been able to really mitigate situations um, and also the successes have Having what um, uh, Kathy said, having those contingency plans in place. If this scenario happens, here's the likely outcome. And then, of course, the flexibility. You can have all the plans you want in place, but you have to look at real time data on the spot and be able to address that. Um, and children will be children. You know, we have really low ratios, we have them, you know. Um, apart but god it's so hard to tell especially an elementary school kid not to hug you or not to elbow fist you but they've learned and part of it is you know we've had to bring in the parents to have conversations it's it's a whole new game um, but it can be done so there it should be lots of optimism about this as well well thank you i think we're really going to rely on your experience and and knowledge as this unfolds especially during the summer so so thank you for that um so Superintendent Hoffman, you mentioned teacher appreciation week i don't think there's a parent in america that doesn't think kids that parents should be or that teachers should be paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars. i think everyone agrees that that's probably the, the what we should be baselining it at um but there is a there is a question that we've gotten from a, from an educator saying that you know fully support the the ability to come back and 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 emotional health but concerned about um, getting something at school and bringing it back to their family that could be, um, you know, they, they could, they, they could be, um, have some immune issues. So what are we, what are we telling uh, teachers? I know it sounds like Chad's got a, 
a pretty well-oiled set for that, but not all schools have the ability to do a four-phase type plan. What are we telling those educators? Yeah, first I want to acknowledge that fear because that's what we saw a couple months ago before we made the decision to close schools in the first place was there was a lot of fear, you know, especially when there's so many unknowns because someone could be, um, someone could have the illness without showing symptoms makes it, things even that much more scarier that people could seem like they're fine or feel fine, not show symptoms, um, but actually be spreading the illness, which just makes it 10 times more terrifying for everyone. Um, so I, I just want to acknowledge that there's going to continue to be that angst and it is very concerning because um, for anyone who is feeling that they are themselves or their family members are immunocompromised, um, we don't have enough substitute teachers or staff to fill those gaps. Um, so this is going to be part of the contingency planning that schools and districts will need to make. And I, I, it goes back to how our schools should be including teachers in their planning process of how can they how can they create a school environment where their educators and staff feel safe um, are you know are they purchasing all the PPE they need to buy are they creating these um, more flexible instructional models or how are they how are they accommodating these fears so the more they can include the staff and educators in that decision making process and talking through the, the planning and processes for disinfecting um, can help provide that reassurance, but at the end of the day, there, people are going to have to make personal decisions for themselves, and there's only so much cover that our schools can provide. And if you decide to take time off because you don't feel safe going to work, um, there's there are limited options around that, and that's an, an HR issue to be dealt with. Um, but I, I I think that is going to be really hard emotionally for people. Is that feelings, how can they feel safe going back to the school environment? Thank you. Got anything you want to add to that? I'll just add uh, just a couple of things. One, first of all, superintendent's right that that's, um, the, there are a lot of fears, uh, well, across America, right? Not just educators. And so ultimately, you know, a, a lot of our educators are going to have to make a choice of are they, are they willing and able to come in or are they not? Because no matter what, right? And Marsh has been doing this for the last two and a half months. There's a, there's a degree of risk when you decide to come in. Um, which that then leads us to why we think that most school systems are going to have to offer options between some will opt to all virtual, some will opt to in person, uh, and and some some form of a hybrid. I think that's uh, that's just going to have to be the reality. I think the scary part for us is, you know, that that you might be in school for two weeks. There's a breakout. Are you going home for two weeks and you're back? I mean, I think that's the unknown for us. Um, is that you know what might that look like if when we bring people back, uh, we continue to have those issues. I think that's gonna be a, a big challenge for, for school systems. You, you bet, and there is a, a question sort of that, that maybe you've just answered it, but the, the question is, you know, if, if someone from the school suffers from COVID-19, so you have one case, are we gonna quarantine the school? Are we gonna send everybody home? How long is that gonna be? You know, some of these questions I'm sure, and, and by the way, I, we know we're answering you, or asking you these hypotheticals that are really hard to answer. But based on what you know today, are you developing protocols for if you get a positive at a school? Then I'll throw that out to either one. Well, I would start by also, let's take a step backwards to also acknowledge that um, this is not the first outbreak that our, our country has ever experienced or our state has ever experienced. Now there's been cases even, not thankfully not so much in Arizona around, but looking at other states like Washington or New York City that have had outbreaks of measles in the last couple of years. So our um, our county health offices are prepared and equipped to help schools through any kind of outbreak situation. And um, so those relationships are really important in making those types of decisions. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to throw that out there that, um, that these, some of these protocols were, have been in place for years in terms of if there is a confirmed case of a contagious illness of what the steps would be, but we just really have to be relying and leaning on our medical experts and the epidemiologists to be providing that guidance for those types of situations. Data is always good. Dr. Guest, anything you want to add to that? No, I think, yeah. I Two, two things. One is, um, as superintendent alluded, you know, we're not going to make those decisions alone. And so if there's a case, uh, you know, we, we as school systems will, will work uh, with officials to make uh, that particular decision. 
um, again, there's just going to be an element of risk. And, um, and we do think that we're going to find ourselves in a position uh, where we're, we're maybe coming back and forth. Again, that's not ideal. Uh, I'd say that the only other thing that, that, uh, that sparked a thought in my mind around, you know, workforce and are we going to have enough people that want to teach, that want to engage in virtual? And I think one interesting trend that we're, uh, that we're following is, you know, we've struggled with teacher workforce over the last, I don't know, you know five, 10 years. Um, but we also will very likely find ourselves in a position over the next year or two where education is and will become one of the most stable institutions in America. And there are a lot of individuals that left the field of education or avoided the field of education because a 40, 50, $60,000 salary didn't sound great because they could pursue a higher salary. And now we have jobs with benefits and retirement. And, and so we also think there's a unique opportunity to potentially bring back uh, educators that have left the field or uh, bring people into the field that have never been in the field before to help us tackle some of these big issues. Thank you. And, and I think that you bring up a good point. I think all of us have seen in organizations um, areas where we had some pretty big deficiencies um, and also areas where we had some strengths that we didn't know we had. So I wonder, you know, thinking about the silver lining to all of this, and I think Chad just brought one up that's really important. What other, what other, what other silver linings do you see to this as once we come out of it? And I'll, I'll throw that out to both of you. Uh, I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll share a, a quote that I heard the other day uh, that COVID-19 is in many ways an accelerator. Um, and it's accelerating things that we already knew need to happen. Uh, and some of those accelerations are maybe sad things like malls and Nordstrom. Like we knew, we knew the demise of those things and the, and the rise of Amazon. This is just expediting that. It's accelerating that. Uh, I think in education that we've been wanting to, to grapple with virtual instruction, wanting to really think about what would it take to become one-to-one -one school districts across America? How are we going to start to tackle digital divide? How do we build digital content? Um, how do we create, create flexible staffing models? Um, and I, I, I think in some ways, all these conversations that we've been having uh, over the last few years, I think are, are going to be accelerated. And uh, I just have to, as I convene superintendents in Arizona, but even work with superintendents across our country, uh, just so proud of, of leadership in our nation and our classrooms that are willing to try really crazy ideas in a really short period of time. And I think we're seeing how remarkable educators are. Um, certified educators, non-certified educators and administrators willing to be bold and innovative uh, like we've never been before. I absolutely couldn't agree more. Superintendent Hoffman? I also couldn't agree more. I definitely want to echo that. Um, I'll share some of the highlights that I heard directly from our students. I recently convened our Student Advisory Council, which is made up of fifth through 12th graders from all across the state of Arizona. And so I asked them, like, what do you, what are the best parts of this, of learning from home? And how much they loved, how flexible schedule. You know, one of our high school students said that she appreciated she could sleep in in the morning, get to her schoolwork on her time. Um, some of the students expressed that they, they could jump ahead. So, and I've heard this from teachers as well, that with the online learning, some of our students are actually jumping ahead at grade level because they are not as restricted as what the current standard is that they're learning in the classroom. They can just jump right ahead if they're, if they're get, you know, doing well and then they can keep advancing. Um, so I've heard that. Um, I've also heard that, um, and this of course could vary from community to community or district to district, but I have heard of, of a greater um, family engagement, greater, um, you know, families feeling more empowered in their students and their child's learning and, and learning more about um, their kids' way of learning. So I think there's a lot, there's like this also new development around family engagement and families feeling more involved in learning and, and hopefully also learning more about what teachers do on a day to day basis, <laughs> because um, I know it's not easy to motivate kids to do schoolwork all day, <laughs> hour to hour. It's not easy um, for anyone. And so um, I think those are the highlights that I've been hearing in addition to what Superintendent Gustin mentioned. Absolutely. There is definitely a new appreciation. Um, as we close out, i um, like to know, and I've been asking folks this, this question, so I'll be interested to hear what you, what you think. We'll start with you, Dr. Gustin. What's keeping you up at night? 
And what, when you wake up in the morning, what, what gets you up with optimism for, to tackle the next day? Uh, what keeps me up at night? I, the, the two things, the wellness, social, emotional wellness of our, of our youth and our families uh, and our employees. I just, uh, we've already known there was a massive need for support and uh, there will be more than ever. The, uh, the achievement gap um, uh, concerns me. I, I can, as I said earlier, I can feel it widening even, even in the hour we've been together. And that's really scary. Uh, you know, what excites me, I think, is that um, uh, to my comment, our comments earlier, that um, we must innovate. And I love living in messy, chaotic, innovative times. And um, I think we're going to see really amazing innovations across our nation uh, and across our state because of this. Um, and, and hopefully, trying to remain optimistic that fast forward three to five years, we'll be in a much better place educationally than we were today. Absolutely. Thank you. Jen Hoffman? Uh, what's keeping me up at night is typically the, the situation on Navajo Nation, that they've experienced one of the worst outbreaks in the country. Um, our students there live in incredibly remote locations. It's extremely difficult for them to access resources, including food. We've um, Thankfully, we've been able to help um, provide some supports there, even um, working with an organization that is mailing food to kids so they get it straight to their home rather than having to drive hours to go pick it up. Um, but even within some of those school districts, they've had sometimes um, over 20 different staff and teachers um, be confirmed for the, having the illness. So I'm like, how do, you, how do you even try teaching when you know your colleagues are sick, you're worried about catching the illness and, and then just you know, the poverty and the limited access to resources. So that's been, as you can tell, really weighing on me um, and doing as much as we can to support, but it's just so many challenges. Um, but I think I share the same optimisms um, in terms of seeing how this is propelling us into greater innovation than we've ever, than we've seen in a long time. And, and also, as I mentioned, truly making it more visible to our communities how critical our schools are and all the different services they provide and whether that's the economic stability the social emotional supports all these different components that are just so critical to the health and to the you know, and thinking about the future of arizona and what's the future that we want um, how critical our schools are in that so i do think that i'm hoping that there's a greater shift in our state around prioritizing public education funding because of that. Well, thank you very much for, for those comments. Now, now you mentioned the um, organization that's um, organizing to send foods to the, to the Navajo Nation. Can you tell us what, what the name of that organization is? Yeah, it's actually Baylor University in Texas, and they've been funded through the USDA. And our schools that are rural or in native communities can apply, and I think we have 18 districts so far participating. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I want to thank uh, Marsha for the, for joining us today for the work that you're doing and for the work you're going to be doing over the summer. We'll want to check in with you again. Dr. Gaston, thank you for the for the for for being here with us for our partnership on the Academy's model. We'll look forward to that. And Superintendent Hoffman, you have a, a, a big job, obviously. Uh, thank you for that. We look forward to partnering with you and getting more laptops to kids. Um, and we hope to have you all back um, uh, as the summer rolls out and we go into the school year to, to get an update. So thank you all very much. And uh, thank you to our sponsors, APS, SRP, and Fenimore Craig. Uh, have a great day and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.